Hi folks, hope you're doing well. Just a little video, I've just been watching something and I thought it's a perfect opportunity to go into a few details about why I don't take any treatment at all for depression. There's a number of reasons why, but one really big reason why is the medication and how incredibly dangerous all the medication for things like depression, anxiety, and all that sort of stuff really is. It is crazy. The people that recommend it, now, as I've said before, you have a physical, a mental, an emotional, and a spiritual existence that we're all in. And the emotional can be the reason why you're going through stuff. The mental could be the reason why you're going through stuff. The physical could be the reason why you're going through stuff. Or it could all be spiritual. So when you're dealing with people, when you're coming to people for treatment who only understand, really, the mental the emotional, maybe the physical, but probably not. Just the mental and emotional. That's what mental health really is looking at. Then there's two areas that they're ignoring. So they, with their best intentions, suggest treatment. And it's the best treatments they have because they don't really have an understanding because they miss out two of the most important areas, the physical and the spiritual. Perfect example is a video that I'm going to link. It's a fantastic video talking about this precise thing. Um, how things like benzos can completely and utterly screw up your life. And this is from a chap called Jordan Peterson, who is one of the world's most experts on self-help. And he speaks about what happened to him, his experience with benzos. I mean, his family, jeez. To say they've gone through it is an understatement of fact. I mean, uh, it sounds as if there's something spiritual going on there. Yeah, the daughter, the husband, and the wife with cancer, where she's told, where everyone's told that she's going to die, but there's no treatment, really. They can operate, but that's really not much of a chance. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll include that um, YouTube bit. Michaela Peterson podcast. With that family update, June 2020. Very interesting. As I say, there's there's many possible treatments for depression. Um. That's all trying to know. Your, your doctor will prescribe one. You'll try that. If that's not doing the job or if that's making things a bit worse, try something else. Um, or maybe up the dose. Up in a dose could have an awful impact that if what you're taking is making things worse, it would just doubly make things worse. Of course, then your doctor will panic and put you on something completely the opposite. Um, and that can fix a few of the issues that the last medication was causing. But you're still with the same problems. And so to me, as I've always said to GPs and stuff like that, you know, I, I can manage the situation. At times it's not easy. At times it isn't. 
tough thing to manage. Really. Well, especially over the last six months. It's been much, much tougher to manage. But it's managed. It's okay. Got through it. It's fine. Um, add medication. Quite likely you're going to create different situations, different problems. And yeah, no thanks. No. So as I say, I will include this. And yeah, that's why I say I, I hope that the church gets sorted out so that the spiritual side can be looked at. We'll put it this way, if you're being guided by the Holy Spirit and you, you're in the healing ministry and you come across somebody similar or with the same sort of situation as Jordan Peterson had, the Holy Spirit will guide you as to what to pray for, what to deal with. You know, he had benzos in his system and he had to go, his family eventually had to take him to Russia so that he could be basically put to sleep. You know, like in a sort of coma sort of situation for nine days. So they could get the benzo out of his system. And they had to clean his blood to do that as well. Because he tried to just stop using it and it was an absolute nightmare. Um, but anyone in that situation, God can flush the benzo out of the person's system. Far quicker than they could in Russia. The next time the person goes for a pee, that benzo is completely out of the system. Because God, God can flush it from the blood into the bladder. And there you go, you wake up desperate to pee. And there you go. Or after praying, you're desperate to pee, not wake up. Because although sometimes you go out in the spirit. And so you get up desperate to pee. But if you're guided through by the Holy Spirit, well then the Holy Spirit can guide you as to exactly what is needed. So if there is um, medical assistance that's needed, well then you, know, you can advise the person to go and seek that medical assistance as well. I mean, generally speaking, there shouldn't be. Because if you are actually called into the ministry of healing then God can there's nothing that God can't deal with not in any way shape or form there's a lot of stuff that we can't see that God can deal with as I said before yeah, what can your faith see that's the point if your faith can see it then God can do it but there's a lot of things that our faith can't see but there's nothing that God can't do. Of all the situations that humans can get into and that they can be in, in themselves, in their bodies, God can deal with all that. There's nothing at all that God can't deal with. So, please, Lord, sort the church out and help your people desire you and to do desire to be led by the Holy Spirit so that they can function in a fat way. I wonder what that was. It was a towel. It was a flicker of a towel and that's a Lucy that was laying beside me. Hey? Lucy. There you go, Lucy. Oh yeah, just something across the floor. For God's sake, it was a flicker of a towel. <laughs> that's what happens when you've got five collies in you. You can always have one day next to you. And for some reason, their tail just flickers. And it's like, oh, wonder what that is. <laughs> oh. Well, the two puppies are doing wonderfully well. Um, they're incredibly people friendly. I take them for a walk in the park every day. And they absolutely love going and seeing people. Yeah, they're so excited to go and say hello to people. 
which is good. I mean, again, part, part of the training, the reason why I take them there is because to a place where you, you have a fair amount of people, what you don't want with pups, with dogs as they get older, is that they see someone, that person could be across the road, and they just go over to go and say hello to the people and get run over in the process. So at this stage, I walk them in the park. They see someone like um, Algy. Algy would see someone. He's called Algy because the people wanted to call him Algin, who had paid the deposit for him. And I thought Algy is a far sweeter uh, version of that. So with him, he is incredibly people friendly. And as we're walking, I will sometimes avoid people sent to some with dogs and he would then make a beeline for the person so i'd have to call him algae this way and after saying it twice he stops turns around and comes and that's what you want that's what you need because it's very much the case with certainly with young dogs anyway you've got to help them to understand it's not their will it's your will because you can see far more than they can see you know far more than they know so it's like, you know, you're trying to keep them safe all they see is that moment yeah they see a possibility of food or they see a possibility of a cuddle from somebody that you see far more. So it's your will, not theirs. Get it into the pups, because once it's into the pups, hopefully when they go to their new homes, that will just continue. I don't walk them on lead. I used to, I used to, because I used to have the use of the gardens above here. So I used to be able to do some lead training on those gardens. With the pups once they got to around about the age i'm now a bit older once they got to about seven week old i'll put them on a lead do a bit of lead training not anymore i leave that up to the new people but i say to them with the lead training we have puppies and it's any pup yeah that pup is going to be resistant of the lead initially Initially, that's always going to be the case. They're going to cry when they're on it. They, they're going to try and stay still. They don't want to go in the direction you're trying to take them. They want to go their way. Again, it's your will, not theirs. That's what you're trying to teach the pup. Um, you want to go this way, pup has to come this way. So you have to drag the pup initially. Now, of course, the pup doesn't really want to be dragged either dragging is worse than going the way you want to go so after a few minutes it starts to walk now you're going to have that situation where even on that first time of walking pup's going to try and go a certain direction while you're going another as soon as the pup realizes it's not going to get its way it stops the dragging starts again then it starts walking. Then after a while, it starts walking in a straight line with you, not trying to veer off in its own direction. Then you've got to go around bends. <laughs> this is where you get <laughs> another problem where pup isn't used to being taken around bends. So pup will then sit or refuse to move. So you have to drag the pup around the bend. So if you're walking around the garden, you come to the end of the garden, so you turn right to come round to then take another right to come the length of the garden again. So, or left, depends on what direction you're going. So you're doing this, and pup is saying, no, nope, I'm not going to do this. On day two, certainly on day three, pup is walking around with you like 
nigh on perfect. What you're going to do now is teach the pup to be on your left or your right. It's up to you. Um, and walk to hill. Now, when you're teaching pup to walk to hill, you start on lead. You say, right, walk to hill. Keep on mentioning, you're walking to hill, to hill. And the pup starts to walk off uh, to hill. You can let the lead go a bit. Hold the lead tight initially. So just give it length, the pup length. Leave length so that the pup can walk to heel. Give it a bit more lead, but again, pull back to heel. Then allow the pup to go forward a bit, but then call back to heel. And the pup should drop back to heel. That way you know you can then do the off lead as well. So train it off lead to heel and then it just comes back comes back to your heel so i mean yeah as i said i i got my five and on one night when it was i think it was early covid roads were incredibly empty i mean the roads are normally empty when we go for our midnight walk anyway um but these were even more empty. So I decided, right, well, yeah, okay. Instead of walking the long way back, I just walk along the road, up the road, because it's far quicker to get home. Of course, you still get occasional bits of traffic, so within no time at all. I think within 20 minutes, I taught them to walk behind me. And I said, behind me, they all sort of file in behind and stay behind. Although they don't do it perfectly because they've had most of their lives. Like Molly is six, Lucy is six, Chewy is six. There were six years of not doing that. But they know when it comes to we come up to roads now, right, get behind me. Yeah, I need to be the one in front because I need to see whether it's safe. And they do that even at this age. And Riley and Amber, who are nearly four. They haven't had that for most of their life. Now, really, I should have taught them that early. So if you've got a young pup, teach it to walk behind you, to stay behind. As well, that's another good trick for it. If it's off lead, you're coming up to traffic, you can just keep the dog behind. As up with mine, they sort of know... If they're waiting at the traffic lights, certainly at night, less so during the day, but at night, you know, if they see no traffic, or they hear no traffic, either way, if they see no cars, they hear no cars, they think they can go. They've got to wait for the beep, 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 beep. You know, press the traffic light thing to stop the traffic. When you get the beep, 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 then they can go. They've got to wait for that. But... When it's quiet, they think they can go anyway. The problem is they don't realise that cars are coming quite fast. Although you can't see a car right now, there could be one coming around the bend. So you've got to wait until it's clear. Just like young children, really. You're teaching dogs as well as you teach young children. Yeah, you've got to wait until it's clear. Until that green little green man... <laughs> says you can cross. Hi. Well, there you go. So, I will link that video of McKayla Peterson's podcast with her dad, talking about all of that. You take care. God bless. I will speak to you soon. See you at a bonus of how to train a puppy or a few training tips. So, there you go. You take care. God bless. Bye-bye.